housing is to strengthen the capacity of FQSCs and PSPCs, health centers, and other health center grantees by providing training and technical assistance. The National Center for Health and Public Housing is a project of North American management and supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration herself. The information or content and conclusion are those of the author and should not be construed at the official position or policy of, nor should be any endorsements by to be inferred by HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. The purpose of this training is to provide a strong understanding of the roles and responsibilities for board members of community health centers, and uh, specifically PHPCs. Uh, our, our panel is, is Jennifer Genua, and I am very pleased to introduce our speaker. Jennifer uh, Genua McDaniel is the former deputy director of the Health Center Association of Nebraska. During her tenure, she developed and led training and technical assistance efforts for all the state's community health centers. She also served as the CEO of a health center in Iowa and Arizona. Previous to being a CEO, Jennifer worked in two FQSCs in Missouri as a health educator. Jennifer is a full-time consultant and provides training and technical assistance to FQSCs and FQSC lookalikes around the country. She also worked closely with the Bureau of Primary Health Care as a reviewer for operational site visits and technical assistance. She is bilingual in, in Italian and is currently working on her master's in public administration at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. Jennifer holds bachelor's and honors degrees in health education and promotion from Brock University, St. Catharines, and uh, in Ontario, Canada. She also completed the Community, the community Health Center Executive, Executive Fellowship Certificate Program at the University of Kent. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Jennifer. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. It depends on what uh, coast you're on. Can everyone see my slides okay? I'm assuming, and if you can't, uh, if you just want to put a little note here. But I am very pleased to be here. I wanted to talk today a little bit about community health centers and how to be an effective board. Um, these are my definitions and acronyms that we will be using. Um, if you look at the top ones, I will be using some of these interchangeably. I know that the Bureau of Primary Health Care or, and or HRSA has put out some definitions of what they actually mean, so I will probably be using these interchangeably. So, And also, my contact information is at the very end, so if you have any questions, comments, um, or if you want some things that I talked about, any tools or templates, please feel free to email me or uh, feel free to contact Dr. Liam. The other portion I wanted to look at is the um, special population funding, so this kind of gives everybody a definition of what the 330G, H, and I mean, because I will just be referring to them via the, um, the alphabet, G, H, or I. So really, we're going to talk today about board member duties. So really, what does that mean to be a, a board member of a health center? So number one, really, it is the duty to care. So really, you need to be careful and prudent when making decisions. You want to be have the duty to be loyal. So really, never do anything purposely that really could harm the health center. Um, I know that um, the board members have to sign, and even staff have to sign conflicts of interest. So you really want to be loyal to your health center. And also the duty to be obedient. So yes, you're going to have, um, you want to voice your opinions. You may have you know, some disagreements or different opinions, and that is okay. Um, if you're, you want to make sure that you can have that majority vote, and then you really want to have to back that decision of the board. Um, and so that are the, your three duties. And if you follow that, and I know that I, every single health center should have directors and officers insurance for their board members, so as long as you act within that, um, that is very important. So really, why do we need to have a community health center governing board? So obviously, like any other nonprofit, it really those boards govern the corporation. And it also is part of your HRSA 19 program requirements. 
and you know you get that notice of award that really is a legal document so you know on the first page you have your face sheet which talks about your numbers what you're getting your uh, financial award assistance when you look at the rest of the pages I know there's probably I don't know up to maybe six or seven pages in that small fine print that's really everything that you have to do so like a business you really have to um, govern and steward health center money and as you know, being a board, that's one of the requirements. So what are the board member responsibilities? And I have taken this from the new policy information notice in 2014-01. So one of the things I recommend to boards when I work with them, not only as a uh, first operational site visit reviewer, but also in working with boards separately, is really go over this in your board meetings. And so I've been asked a lot, okay, what do boards need to do? And this is exactly, I have spelled out exactly what their responsibility is. So number one, you have to hold monthly meetings. You have to maintain your records and minutes and verify that the board is functioning. And so if you look at this new PIN, um, there really now is a provision to have telecommunication. So you have to meet monthly. And I get a lot of questions, especially on the East Coast, you know, what if we have a snowstorm or I can't meet? That's exactly what it is. It's monthly meetings. So you have to have a meeting in December, even if there's a holiday. Um, in January, there has to be 12 months of meetings. And that's why the Bureau has made these provisions for telecommunication. So as long as you can speak and hear, um, that can um, act as a meeting and you just have to document that. The caveat that I always tell individuals is that you want to check with your each individual state law, especially when it comes to the Open Meeting Act and also what governs your nonprofit. So you want to at least check with that. The other thing the board needs to do is you have to approve applications related to that health center project. So I like to call, you know, that Form 5A, B, and C, that is your bread and butter. That is your scope of project. And so any anytime you change that, anything you have for a change in scope, um, the Bureau has done an amazing job now. If you go on their website, they have um, an actual website or web page dedicated to Form 5A, B, and C, and it re they have really listed out how to, um, you know, with your service descriptors and their definitions. So the board really needs to approve that. You also need to approve um, any application. So I know right now there's federal funding for that oral health expansion. If there's any future funding coming out for new access points, anything that is related to the Bureau um, and to your grant has to be approved by the board. You also, the board also has to approve the annual health center budget and audit. Um, and when it comes to the audit, it's actually the board that approves the auditor and the auditor reports directly to the board. So yes, the CEO and the um, organization, they get those three bids um, if, it's your, if it's time to um, you know, rebid the process, but that really is the decision of the board. The other one it talks about is the long-term strategic planning. So really looking at you know, how are you doing with your strategic plan? You know, is your mission appropriate? How are your goals? You know, how are you reaching if you're thinking about expanding in the future or adding services? Um, are you meeting those goals? And then evaluating. So maybe you thought about in the next two or three years you want to expand and apply maybe for some special populations funding or maybe you want to open up a mobile dental unit. You know, how are you meeting those progress goals? The other thing the board needs to do is selecting services as well as the location and mode of delivery of those services. And again, that goes back to Form 5A, B, and C. So maybe you want to add um, acupuncture or pediatrics or OB. Um, maybe you want to open up a school-based health center. That really comes from not only looking at your needs assessment, but also that is where the board really needs to approve those. And also determining the hours of operation. 
So really, are they appropriate and responsive to the community needs? It goes back to patient surveys or your needs assessment. Perhaps you're not open on Saturday, but you notice that you know your third next available, you're you're far out, you know, and really your patient surveys. You have you know single parents that work you know up until six o'clock and they can't get in to have their kids come see your pediatrician. How do you determine that? And that's where, when you look at all of that, your board really needs to they, um, approve the hours of operation. They also approve the selection, dismissal, and evaluating the performance of your health center CEO or executive director. I um, see a lot of this. So the board only has one employee, and that is your CEO or executive director. So yes, you can have, perhaps you have an ad hoc committee that is going to, you know, start and put together the performance evaluation of the CEO, but the approval, the evaluation, everything has to go to the full board. And the other thing is establishing general policies and procedures for the health center, and they have to be consistent with your health center program re uh, requirements. So if you go to that pin that I listed above, and then on page eight and nine, there's actually a list of policies and procedures um, that need to be approved by the board. And then lastly, I threw this in here, is the privileging of health center providers. Um, you know, there's credentialing and there's privileging. So privileging is pretty much saying, yes, we give permission for these providers um, to practice within their scope of project. And so it's medical, dental, behavioral health. Um, they need to be reappointed every two years, especially if you have um, FTCA or Federal Tort Claim Act. The one caveat that I always tell grantees is if you are um, accredited or deemed by NCQA for patient-centered healthcare home or other accrediting bodies, such as Joint Commission, you really need to watch that um, privileging because NCQA says that a provider can be recredentialed for um, every two, every three years, and it really needs to be every two years. So these are the board responsibilities. Um, just all of them. This is everything the board needs to do. I get also a lot of questions regarding consent agendas, and so really what I tell grantees that is anything on this list that needs a HRSA approval needs to be pulled out of the consent agenda and made it a separate motion. So talking about board composition, because we've had a lot of questions about this in the past, and I think the PIN has done an amazing job with really defining it. So yes, we know that 51% of the board need to be um, individuals who are served or patients right, of your health center. Um, they need to be a current or registered patient and must have access to health center in the past 24 months, and they have to be at least in one or more in-scope services. So again, this goes back to that Form 5A, A, B, and C with regards to your scope. And then visits are defined that they have to be a documented face-to-face -face between a patient and a provider. They have to exercise independent professional judgment in the provision of services with that patient. And so I use myself as an example. I'm a health educator. I have an NPI number. I can see patients in a clinic. I do not exercise independent professional judgment even though I, uh, because I work under a physician. So my visit is considered an enabling service. So um, that would not count. The other um, area is that they have to reasonably represent the individuals who are served by the health center in terms of race, ethnicity, and sex. Um, I get a lot of questions regarding, well, what's the ratio? And unfortunately, there is, I can't tell you what it is. There is no ratio. It is what your service area is defined. It must be reasonably represent that your patient population. The one thing I do refer grantees to is what are those, your class standards, so culturally, linguistically, and appropriate services. So you really want to look at that. Um, anyone that is a legal guardian of a patient who is a dependent child or adult or a legal sponsor of an immigrant, they can be considered a patient for the purpose of board representation. I get a lot of questions, what about husbands and wife? And the answer is no, okay, so it needs to be either that person that serves on the board, 
um, the parent or guardian of a child um, or legal sponsor of an immigrant um, or the legal guardian. And then finally, no more of half of the non-patient representatives may derive more than 10% of their income from the healthcare industry. So for board composition, when it comes to health centers that have special populations funding, so GH&I, so migrant and seasonal farm workers, homeless and public housing, you really need to have, you must have patient representation on that board. So to really target that patient population that served from the health center. So you need to have at least one board member that is representative of that special population. So for example, if you have public housing funding, do you have someone on your board that can advocate for that patient population? Maybe it's someone from the housing authority, maybe it's someone that lives there. Um, but the interesting part is that, yes, they can be counted as a representative for that special population, but they won't be counted as, um, as a patient unless they're also health center patients. So you really have to go back to that statue of what, what does that mean, a patient? It really has to be representative of that community. For individuals or health centers that have just migrant and seasonal um, that special funding, so no other Section 330 funding, there is this uh, caveat for those entities. So 51% must be migrant and our seasonal farm workers. They can be current farm workers or retired due to age and or members of their families who are served by the health center. And then no more of two-thirds of the non-patient rep representatives may derive more than 10% of their annual income from the health care industry. So this caveat right here is just for those health centers that receive migrant funding. No other funding. So really, the next portion is what is, now that we've gotten through all the HRSA requirements of what boards need to do, what does it mean to govern? And so you really need to look at number one, define and preserve your mission. You know, I ask a lot of a lot of boards, you know, what is your mission? Tell it to me. Don't read it to me. You know, do you understand, commit to, and clarify your mission? You know, do you set goals and objectives based on your mission? You know, sometimes when we're doing strategic plan, maybe you want to look at other lines of businesses, you want to open up a thrift shop or um, I don't know, any other line of business, but does that support the mission of your health center? The other thing when it means to govern is you um, boards need to make policy. So the board sets the policy and the staff carries out the procedures. And I just wanted to list, sometimes there's four areas of policies that they fall into. So you have personnel, financial, clinical, operations, and another one sometimes is also IT, now that we're um, almost all of our health centers are electronic, so you also have IT as well. A board also needs to safeguard the assets of the community health center. So we talked about that notice of award, it's a legal document. The board has a fiduciary responsibility, so making sure that they steward that those Section 330 funding appropriately. So they look at your health center finances, your budget, we talked about the annual audit previously, um, and then again, um, safeguarding the CEO and or, and or executive director. Um, the other one, number four, is selecting, evaluating, and the performance of the CEO. So again, they only have one employee, and that is the CEO. And that CEO is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. So what they will probably end up doing is, you know, they have a team that he or she will delegate to. And so that CEO needs to make sure that they have a clear and concise job description and they're evaluated according to the document. Especially if some, I've seen some health centers or some health center boards, but their CEO that's an employee will do maybe some type of a bonus incentive, um, and especially during performance evaluation. So make sure that the objectives are clear, concise, and also measurable. Lastly, really looking at monitoring and evaluating um, the board. You know, 
Uh, is the health center meeting the mission? As we talked about earlier, especially if you're wanting to go into other lines of business, does it meet your mission? How do you know that your health center is meeting the mission? And then what reports does the board receive to see whether you're meeting the mission? So really looking at maybe your quality or your no-shows, you know, your cost per patient. What is the board receiving in order for them to have that oversight that we talked about earlier? And then really also I look at, um, you know, especially during operational site visits or technical assistance, how is the board doing? Really doing an annual board self-evaluation. So are you meeting your responsibilities? You know, do you, uh, do you as, I don't know if there's any board members on the line, but, you know, are you interacting with your CEO, with the community, with each other? Do you promote your health center? Are you proud to be a board member? You know, and finally, what are the board goals? Maybe, you know, once a quarter you learn, you go through the program requirements, 1 through 19. Or maybe you have a board goal where um, you want to learn about what a profit and loss statement is. What does it mean by a statement of operations? And these are things that you can put in your strategic plan, you know, really want to look at not only do you have health center goals, but you also have um, board goals. Finally, um, strategic planning, you know, in the past probably a year, year and a half, we've noticed with um, the grant cycles, they've gone from a five-year to a three-year um, cycle. So really looking at, you know, one to three-year plan. Right now, there's so much change going on in the healthcare environment. We have the Affordable Care Act that has been implemented. You know, some states have expanded Medicaid. You know, in the future right now, do you have a PPS payment? Are you going to an alternative payment with regards to um, how you get paid per um, encounter? Things like that are changing. And so really, having a strategic plan, not just making something, putting it on the shelf, and then not looking at it. It really is your roadmap. So you need to have you know, written goals and objectives with timelines. You want to make sure you implement it and then evaluate the plan and report it out. And sometimes when you have a plan, it's okay if maybe it doesn't work out. But you know what? At least you had it, you tried it, you can report on it. Because sometimes as we get through a planning, boards, you know, with recommendations from the CEO, they sometimes have to make some tough decisions, whether it be to downsize, maybe they are having some issues financially, closing sites, whatever it is. But as a board, you need to be able to make just tough decisions and be effective at what you do. So really looking at the nuts and bolts of board the board membership, so you have your officers. You have your president or your board chair, whatever you call them. Um, and really, they promote the teamwork and decision by consensus. They are the ones that act as a liaison between the CEO or the executive director and the board. They're really that major resource for the leader, for the CEO. Um, this individual would chair the board meetings. Um, they can assign tasks to other members or committees. And they're also part of the executive committee, and they can also be the ex officio um, of that committee. So I've really seen where um, the president or board chair and the CEO work closely together as well. And I know that there's other trainings out there specifically around CEO and board president or board chair um, working together to collaborate um, and work well. The next one is the vice president or vice chair. So really they act as a backup for that president or that chair in their absence. Maybe they can take on special assignments such as project or ad hoc committees. Maybe um, you're thinking about expansion, if there's some, you know, if there's capital funding that's coming, that individual can help with those types of different areas. They are really staying on top of current issues and operations. And they are, as well, part of the executive committee. The secretary, they are the ones that are in charge of the meeting minutes, of the board meeting. And so want to make sure that they're signed with a date. Um, if you've read the new PIN, um, and also if you look at your HRSA site visit guide that her, um, the Bureau has, 
the Hertz site visit guide for operational site visits, if you look at page 31, which is program requirement number 17, board authority, it really talks about attendance and how to monitor the attendance of the board um, members and making sure that they're following their policy and bylaws. Um, they send out meeting reminders, and they are also part of the executive committee. And finally, the treasurer. They are the ones really that work very, sometimes very closely with the CFO. They can help with the annual budget or operational budgets or departmental budgets. Um, they can report out regarding the financial report to the board. They can review the audit. And they also can help with perhaps, you know, do you need a, a narrative or a profit and loss sheet, looking at no-shows, productivity, that type of stuff. They can help guide the CFO if the board says, you know, hey, we are not finding what we need, can you provide this document? So they are also part of the executive committee, and they are also the chair of the finance committee. So really, why do we need standing committees? Um, really, that's where the work is done. And these are some of the most common committees that I've seen in health centers. So you have the executive committee, and it specifically states in the new PIN, um, and it, if you put it in your bylaws, that the, this committee has authority to act on behalf of the full board in case of an emergency. But in your bylaws, you actually have to specify the circumstances in which this board, you, uh, the full board authorizes the committee to act. And then any action that this committee, the executive committee takes, has to be brought back to the full board for a vote. And then you need to record that vote, vote in the board minutes. Then you, you know, obviously we talked about the finance committee, um, quality improvement, so really looking at quality. If you are deemed with Federal Tort Claim Act or malpractice, you need to have this committee to look at your quality. Um, maybe you have a personnel committee looking at salary ranges. And then also a nominating committee. So each year um, you want to look at your officers um, to see whether you need to vote new board members or have new officers. And then actually you can have ad hoc or temporary uh, committees. So like we talked, maybe you need to review your bylaws. You realize that you're not in compliance with the new PIN that's out. Um, maybe you're looking at expansion. Maybe you need to look at having, you know, doing the CEO evaluation. So really, you can have temporary committees as well. Again, so why do we really need committees? So number one, it really does save time and streamline effort, and that really is where the work of the board is done. You do your work within your committees. So you're looking at your reports, your issues, and then the committees will report back to the full board and make recommendations. So we know that committees have no power to make policy. Remember, it's the full board that comes together to make those recommendations. And actually, I've seen a lot where committees are a great way to recruit board members. Maybe um, you have the Quality Improvement Committee, and you have someone from public health or an optometrist. You're looking at adding vision, and you want that individual to serve on your committee. So that's really a great way to recruit board members. Um, and then if there is a vacancy that's open and they realize, you know what, I've sat on this committee, I like the work the health center is doing, you know, could I um, join your board? You know, they can fill out the, the application to be a board member. And finally, we do not want rubber stamping. So we want to make sure that everyone has a voice, you know, that they're just saying, well, you know, Mr. Smith voted on this, I agree with him, so you know what, I trust his judgment. I'm really good with that. I'm just going to vote yes because he did. So we do not want rubber stamping. Everybody has a voice because they are representing um, that patient, that patient population, that target area. I was asked to talk a little bit about waivers. So I have a couple of slides on this. So if you recall, the new PIN that the Bureau has put out made it quite clear that there are no more waivers for the monthly, the meeting requirements, but you can request a waiver of 51% majority governance requirement. So, and this is, um, so if you can't meet that patient population of 51%. So this is only for those health centers um, that only receive special population funding and not that Section 330E. So only if you receive 
um, special POPs funding. And it has to be in a special, po uh, sparsely populated rural area. And so the definition that's in this PIN is that the entire service area would have seven or fewer people per square mile at the time of the waiver application. So if you decide to go that route, and if you meet the definition as discussed in the PIN, some of the things you need to look at are you have to demonstrate good cause as to why you can't meet the statutory requirement, okay? And then you also have to present alternatives of how you're going to meet the statute. So how are your patients going to be represented in terms of the organization, the direction, um, ongoing governance? So there's a couple of areas. There's number one, so there's the good cause. So based on your unique situation, you need to, and this is where I recommend to work with your project officer, um, you know, you need to have a description of the population to be served and the characteristics of the area. You need to demonstrate what you've done to, to date to make sure to meet this requirement and why attempts have not been successful. So maybe it's difficult to retain and recruit um, you know, homeless, if you have homeless funding, homeless board members or, you know, in a sparsely rural populated area. So how are you attempting to meet that 51%? And then you need to have an alternative mechanism. So yes, you can't meet that 51%, but how, you know, I'm working with your project officer, how are you going to make sure that the voice of those patients are heard? So you have to have an acceptable plan. So you have to have a clear description of an alternative mechanism. So how are you going to gather that input? Will it be through focus groups? Will it be through patient surveys? And then again, the specific type of patient input to be collected. So what are you going to collect? You know, is it about hours? Do you need an additional site? And then actual formal process for communicating that input to the board. So I have seen with um, health centers that have waivers, a monthly presentation, maybe some quarterly reports from the patient survey, and then specifics on how your, that board will use um, the input from those patients. So looking at services, hours of operation, budget priorities, you know, patient satisfaction, those type of things. So, once you have your alternative mechanism, you have a plan, it's been approved by the Bureau or your project officer and the board, how are you going to make sure that your patients have a voice if you don't have that 51% users? And so I wanted to provide to you with some patient, an actual best practice, and I, um, we've seen with health centers that have waivers, they actually have a patient advisory council and so what that is, is a significant number of patients are those special populations. They meet, they have to meet regularly, so maybe you decide to meet once a month or quarterly, and there has to be a clear line of authority between the board and this advisory council. And so the advisory council, they're not expected to meet the board requirements, and they're not recognized as fulfilling the requirements. So if you have a board waiver and you also have a patient advisory council, in your Form 6A that you submit to your project officer and your EHB, you only list the board members and not the advisory council. And so if you go to that pin on page 13, um, it provides you a little bit more description. So due to time constraints, I couldn't write a little bit more, but these are kind of the general overview. And then um, some really looking at board meeting tips, you have to meet monthly. We talked about that there is no more waiver. Um, it has to be, con you can conduct it by telephonic, maybe through Skype, as long as the parties can listen and speak to each other. Um, and then again, check with your requirements for your state. Um, usually you have an annual meeting. It's usually 30 to 60 days after your fiscal year end. Um, you really look at your year, your annual report, that's where you do your nomination of officers. Um, sometimes I see board agendas in um, cognizance with committee chairs and senior staff, so maybe if you have some standing um, committees, they kind of work together to say, okay, I want this on the board agenda. It's important to have clear expectations and engagement. 
Uh, benchmarking is very important, especially now um, with the quality indicators that are coming out and incentives on you know, meeting certain UDS indicators that health centers are reporting on. And then finally, you really want to have transparency. That's important. One of the questions that I get asked a lot about is looking at the delineation between the CEO and the board. And I wanted to just, I put together this um, kind of this little chart that talks about what the board's role is and what the CEO's role. And so if you really look at their action items, if you look at the board's role, they develop, they guide, they establish policy, they choose the CEO, they evaluate, they review the quality of care, they represent that community interest. And then when you look at the CEO's role, they're really doing it or um, fulfilling what the board is telling um, the CEO to do in terms of delegation. So he or she is communicating the mission statement. They're implementing, they're implementing policy. They're ensuring timely and accurate reporting to the board. They're achieving those organizational goals. They are managing um, the operations through delegation of their staff. They're monitoring the quality of care. And then they also represent the health center needs. I wanted to add some helpful resources. Um, these four have been really helpful to me. Um, the first two are really on the program requirements and the new pins that have come out. I uh, really recommend looking at that sliding fee scale pin, um, especially now doing budgets um, with the federal and non-federal that you have to report out. Um, there's the National Qual um, Cooperative Agreement, HRSA, just recently um, funded those three additional national cooperative agreements. So really there are a lot of resources out there for you. And then finally, I just have my contact information. Um, so if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can talk with um, Dr. Leon, and this is my contact information. And that's all I have. Thank you, Jennifer, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, we're going to start a Q&A session. If you would like to ask a question to Jennifer, uh, please submit it through the question box on your control panel. Or if you are dialed in through your phone and would like to verbally ask uh, Jennifer a question, uh, use the raise hand icon, and your, control, uh, and your line will be unmuted. Right. Uh, while we wait for uh, some questions, uh, I would like to ask all attendees to please complete the post survey. Uh, this helps the National Center for Health and Public Housing to improve our webinars. And um, we have a question for Ms. Uh, Genoa. Is the first question is how do I select or re recruit individuals to serve on my board? That's a great question. And I always refer back to um, your staff. Um, your, you want to be the provider and the employer of choice. And staff are amazing. So sometimes if you want to meet that, and the other caveat is the program requirements are a floor, not a ceiling. So yes, they should be 51%, but I love it when I see close to 100%. So you can check with your providers, um, your front desk. Um, you can talk internally. And also your board members are also a great way as well. So maybe when you do your board matrix, you realize that you need someone perhaps that has a, you need a finance background. Um, you know that or you need a CPA or looking at adding services and you want someone that has that expertise um, that's where your board really can come into play in talking with the chair of the nominating committee to go out and ask um, but from an internal perspective your staff are amazing they deal they work with that patient population or the target population on a daily basis so they definitely would be able to promote that 
I've also seen where there have been some ads sometimes in the paper. I have seen some notes um, in the bulletin board in the waiting room. And also on your patient satisfaction, I've also seen where it said, would you consider being a board member? Do you want to be contacted? Would you like us to send an application? So those are just some of the other best practices that I've seen around the country. Great. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for uh, your uh, answer. Uh, there is another question. Uh, how, do we how do we develop healthier staff and board relations to effectively implement policies? Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Sure. How do we develop healthy staff and board relations to effectively implement policies? Ah, that's a really good question. <laughs> well, I know that there's, and that's a fine line, obviously. And I, one of the things I've seen is interaction between the board and staff during, um, you know, recognition or that once a year policy. Um, I think at times, um, and I guess, you know, that CEO is that, that employee of the board. So you don't want to circumvent that. But if there is something, um, I think there needs to be that channel. I've also seen it through the committees. So for example, the Quality Improvement Committee, sometimes you know you have board, instead of having a separate committee of the board, you can have, you have board members sit on those committees. So I've seen that type of interaction um, where board members and staff board work together. Um, fundraising, maybe you want to do a capital campaign. Um, yes, you know, it's the responsibility of the board and of the staff together, but really um, you can work together. I've also seen board members um, go to staff meetings, but there really, I think, has to be that fine line. Um, I don't think there, there is a black or white answer, unfortunately. I think is there's a gray area, um, and I think that, unfortunately, it's a case by case, but those are some of the things that I've seen. Okay, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, there is one more question. Um, the question is basically if you have any tips for assessing and monitoring needs of uh, populations, of a special population. Do I have any tips on assessing? For assessing and monitoring needs of uh, populations in general. Oh, um, usually through sur surveys or one of the things I've actually seen is um, for patients perhaps that are Hispanic or don't um, or speak an Eng a language other than English. I don't know if they use translators, if you have translators on site, but usually those community health workers or those translators or those individuals that actually work with that patient population have been able to provide really good feedback. Um, and I've seen a lot of stuff done with the, like the promotoras, so the, the health workers, um, and also even your outreach and enrollment staff, I think are, that's important as well. Okay. Great. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. We have more questions coming in. Uh, someone is asking if you could uh, briefly review again the policies that the board uh, needs to approve. Sure. In fact, if you give me one second, I will. I can read them to you from the pen. And the one thing I do want to say is we did not cover anything. I don't know if there's any public health centers out there with a co-applicant, um, and that's also in the pen. So some of the health centers, um, so specific policies are board member selection and dismissal procedures, employee salary and benefit scale, so there the board is approving the salary ranges, not the position. Employee grievance procedures, equal opportunity practices, codes of conduct, quality improvement system, fee schedules for services, for sliding fee discount program, billing and collections, financial policies that assure accountability for your health center resources, and conflict of interest. 
And so those can be found in that pin on page eight and nine. So those are kind of a general overview of all the stuff the board needs to approve, those policies. Great. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. There is one more question. Uh, and it says, for board members' employment, how is healthcare industry defined? Does this include behavioral uh, or mental health and substance abuse? Yes. So anything that is related, so that is related, so like physicians, psychiatrists, LCSWs, um, dentists, that that is considered um, healthcare. They work in a hospital, long-term care. And I can look on finding something more specific. It's interesting that that question comes up because um, sometimes the question I get is, you know, is public health considered health care, you know? And so the, the PIN doesn't really state that. So I will, I think that's a great question and I will look for that. Um, because I don't know everything. I'm human just like everybody else. So I'm always learning as well. So I will look for that and then I will um, get back to that person or if that individual wants to email me or Dr. Leon if you want to. Um, that's usually what I consider to be healthcare. Sure, and I believe that we have the contact information, uh, Jennifer, so we can uh, re uh, reply and send uh, additional information to uh, Perfect. Yeah. Now, uh, there is one more question here. Uh, could the uh, uh, could the personnel committee approve the privileging of health care providers or should they or should they only recommend uh, approval they, by the full board? For sure. So personnel they can recommend it has to go to the full board because it's really the full board with scope of projects. And also don't forget you also have to approve your locum tenum and your contracts, your volunteer providers, if you have volunteer or contracted providers, it's anyone that's going to be practicing. And you also want to make sure that you have in that policy, um, if there's an emergency like termination of privileges, um, you need to have that in there. And they can't be longer than 120 days. Um, so let's say there, um, you know, you have a, you hired a provider, you hired a doctor, and they're going to be started. You have you can put in your policy if you choose that 120 days, um, but that it has to go to the full board, full board. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, sorry, but uh, I am trying to triage all the questions that we are getting. And there is another question here. Uh, we are having a difficult time recruiting for the board. Uh, we are using the staff, providers, and also have reached out to other community boards. Any additional suggestions? Also, uh, what are your thoughts in regards to using interpreters during the board meeting to meet the needs of board members that wish to serve but English is their second language? I think interpreters are a great idea to use. In fact, if you have a special population, they don't speak English, you know, you definitely need to use that. Uh, make sure that interpreter signs a conflict of interest or confidentiality, so that's very important. Um, in terms of other places, I don't know if maybe you can kind of query your patient base, um, grocery stores, churches. I've seen different areas. I find sometimes it's very hard or very rural. Um, as you know, immediate family members cannot be on the board, um, especially with conflicts of interest. So I can think of, I don't know if that's a specific health center in a certain area. I can, if they want to contact me or you, and I can continue to brainstorm, but those are kind of some of the areas. Some of it, I don't, you know, movie theater. I know that sounds kind of silly, but you know, wherever your wherever your patient population is. All right. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. There are two more questions in the queue. Uh, one is, how important is it for all board members to contribute financially? Great question. I got. I hear a lot of that. 
So there is no requirement, correct, um, regarding that they have to um, contribute financially. So there's nothing in the program requirement. Um, in fact, it's a community board, it's a volunteer, and, you know, they can, if they meet the federal poverty guidelines, they can have, you know, some of their expenses paid. Um, it's interesting because I hear that, especially if you're looking for additional funding or leveraging funding, you know, maybe with the United Way or some other uh, local community group. And usually when you write your grants or your proposals, it's nice to say, you know, 100% of our board members contributed. There, you know, you don't want to put a set amount because you don't want to have a burden on that board member. Maybe they can only contribute 25 cents or a dollar. Um, and I don't, it, it shouldn't be a requirement to be on the board, but if, um, I think if that's important to you, you definitely, um, you, it can't be a requirement. The other thing I've seen is um, where staff also contribute. So you can say, you know, 100% of our staff and 100% of our board have contributed to our cause, you know, to help maybe with taxi vouchers or whatever. And that really shows that community involvement. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. There is another question, uh, uh, Jennifer, about a board member who passed away during the last year. But I believe that, uh, if possible, uh, we can answer this question by email. Perfect. And uh, uh, I will uh, forward it to you, and then we can respond uh, directly. Absolutely, and I'm sorry for that loss. That's very sad. All right, and um, I do not have uh, any additional questions. Uh, one more time, I would like to thank uh, Jennifer for this wonderful presentation. And um, to all attendees, I uh, invite you to visit our website, uh, the National Center for Housing Public Housing. You can find information about upcoming uh, webinars uh, or archive webinars. We have monographs, uh, fact sheets, uh, training manual, uh, newsletters, information about our uh, uh, conference, and information on, on how to submit uh, or, uh, tr uh, any, if you have any training or technical assistance needs, uh, there is a form that you can fill out and one of the, our uh, talented staff will contact. Uh, you can also, uh, you can mail, uh, you can join our mailing list and receive HRSA updates, um, information on Medicare, information on funding opportunities, information about senior programs, and other resources and services. Uh, you can also f uh, follow us on Twitter, and you can subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. And this is the contact information for uh, the National Center for Health and Public Housing staff, and if you have any contact or you need any training or you have any training or technical assistance need, our phone number is 703-812-8822. And one more time, I would like to thank uh, Jennifer Genoa for this wonderful presentation, and have a great afternoon.